How much protein does an aspiring bodybuilder need? Some have indicated that everyone looking to build muscle need anywhere between 0.5 to 3.5 per kilogram of body weight. That's not particularly exact. So why the discrepancy? And what did Mike Menser recommend? Let's find out. One reason for the discrepancy indicated is that your protein requirement is determined by your body weight. Consequently, since we don't all weigh the same, our protein requirements vary. And unless your body weight increases or decreases dramatically, your protein requirements remain pretty stable. While protein can be converted to glucose and then used for fueling muscular contractions, this only happens if there is insufficient glucose available on site in the muscles being trained or in the bloodstream. In such cases, the body will take a molecule or molecules, depending upon the need, of an amino acid and convert it to glucose through a process called gluconeogenesis. As Mike pointed out, weight training burns sugar. And if you're not getting sugar from fruits or vegetables, cereals or grains, where's your, where's your muscle going to get sugar to continue contracting? From your own muscle. There's an amino acid contained in your muscle tissue called alanine, which will be broken down, sent to your liver and turned into glucose. That's why carbohydrates are called protein sparing. It spares your protein from being used for energy. And while the body can do this, it's not its preferred way to obtain energy substrate. It would prefer as little energy as possible to obtain the energy required for the job. The body prefers that its energy come from carbohydrate sources that can be broken down and converted to glucose far more rapidly than protein or fat sources can. This way, protein is spared for its primary purpose of growth and repair. But again, as muscle growth and repair do not occur in dramatic fashion, one's protein requirements will stay quite stable until such time as one's body weight actually changes. The other problem with trying to project how much extra protein one requires to build whatever muscle growth might have been stimulated by one's efforts in the gym is that even a 10-pound gain of muscle in a year comes out to less than half an ounce gained per day. This is not enough to even register on a body weight scale, and that's assuming you trained intensely enough and rested sufficiently enough to allow that muscle growth adaptation to take place. Add into this matrix the genetic component that some gain faster than others and have the potential to grow far greater muscle mass than others, and you're left with a question mark. How much extra protein do you need? That will depend on how much muscle you will gain. How much muscle will you gain? That will depend on your genetic potential for gaining muscle and how efficient your training and recovery is. We can't know in advance how many pounds of muscle we will gain over the course of a year. And so, consuming a protein quantity to build an unknown amount of muscle is a fool's errand. It is also why exercise and nutritional scientists base protein requirements on the here and now what you actually weigh today, rather than on fanciful projections or wishful thinking of how big you want your muscles to be. The belief of most bodybuilders, however, is that you need lots of protein. Here, Mike Menser comments on this phenomenon. Most of us think muscle equals protein. When you think of protein, you think of muscle. When you think of pro muscle, you think of protein, vice versa. Just so happens that muscle is comprised of 70% water, 22% protein, 6 to 8% lipids, 8 and inorganic material. So, the primary constituent of muscle tissue is not protein, but water. Does that mean that we hasten the muscle growth process by drinking 10 gallons of water a day? Many bodybuilders operate under the assumption that if muscle is protein, well then the more protein we eat, the faster we grow. We can't eat enough protein because muscle is made of protein. Well, if you recognize the fact that it's made of water, you would think then, well, the more water you drink, the faster you'll grow. But what happens when you drink more water than you need? You pee a lot. <laughs> but you don't have the same impunity with protein because protein contains calories and you eat more calories than you need to maintain yourself, what happens? You excrete it in part, and the excess turns to fat. 
and protein can make you just as fat as carbohydrates or fats. They all contain calories, and it's excess calories that make you fat. They're all broken down in the same essential elements, the amino acids, glucose, what have you, fatty acids. Doesn't matter. In order to be used by the human body, they're all broken down in exactly the same way. It's important to understand that excess calories are converted to glucose, and excess glucose gets stored as fat. This, as Mike Benzer pointed out, is true for any source of energy, carbohydrates, fats, and protein. Researchers from the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, and McGill University, for example, have all concluded that consuming too many calories, including from protein sources, can result in increased glucose levels, increased insulin levels, and ultimately, more body fat. According to the Mayo Clinic, quote, body can't store protein, so once needs are met, any extra is used for energy or stored as fat. Excess calories from any source will be stored as fat in the body. Close quote. From the Cleveland Clinic, quote, High protein intake also means ingesting excess calories. Your body turns excess protein into fat, so it's important to know how much you need in order to maintain your weight or to lose weight if that's your goal. Close quote. McGill University. Quote, extra protein does not get stored. Instead, excess amino acids get converted to carbohydrate or fat. Thus, it seems that additional protein intake will not directly increase muscle growth, strength, or physical performance, and could even lead to weight gain and fat deposition, which are surely negative consequences for any athlete. Close quote. Although protein offers a number of health benefits, more of this macronutrient does not equal better. We've seen that if you consume more calories than your body needs from protein sources, the excess can be converted to fat. And here's how it happens. Protein is first metabolized into amino acids and ammonia. The leftover carbon compound is converted into glucose, which your body uses for energy. If your cells have enough glucose and there is no space left to store it as glycogen in your muscles or liver, this excess glucose is converted into fat and stored. There is a lot of talk among advocates of low-carbohydrate diets that carbohydrates should be avoided because they raise insulin levels in the body, which, they say, leads to fat deposition. However, it may surprise some to learn that scientific research has also indicated that some people produce more insulin in response to proteins and fats than carbs which suggests that insulin production is more individualized than first believed. A recently published study by Reitman et al. concluded, quote, dietary proteins have an insulinotropic effect and thus promote insulin secretion, which indeed leads to enhanced glucose clearance from the blood. In the long term, however, a high dietary protein intake is associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, Moreover, branched-chain amino acids, BCAA, a prominent group of amino acids, were recently identified to be associated with diabetes, close quote. Even whey protein, for example, has been shown to be more insulogenic than white bread. And beef has been shown to stimulate just as much of an insulin release as brown rice. And the insulin response to protein is not more moderate and prolonged. Indeed, protein has been shown to cause a rapid spike in insulin, followed by a rapid descent, just like carbohydrates. There is even evidence that a high-protein meal can cause more immediate fat storage than a high-carbohydrate meal, owing to the fact that dietary fat that most protein sources are contained in is stored very efficiently as body fat. Harvard University further claims that too much protein has the potential to raise the risk of kidney stones and that a high-protein diet that contains lots of red meat and higher amounts of saturated fat might lead to a higher risk of heart disease and colon cancer. And if that's not enough to back one off from overemphasizing protein, it has also been clinically established that certain amino acids within protein have been shown to nourish cancer cells. So, too much protein is not a good thing, but how much is too much? 
and what have the experts determined our daily need to be? According to the Food and Nutrition Board, 32 to 46 grams of high quality dietary protein is required each day for most of us to maintain our body's protein balance. Moreover, they tell us, the average person already ingests way more than this on a daily basis. American adults, for example, are found to consume 65 to 100 plus grams of protein per day, more than double the amount needed to maintain our protein balance. So, the evidence suggests that most of us are already obtaining more protein than we require to maintain our protein balance. But how much daily protein would a bodybuilder looking to build muscle require? Ellington Darden, who holds a doctorate in exercise science, spent two years of postdoctoral study in food and nutrition, and was also a competitive bodybuilder. He revealed that, quote, Nutritionists have devised a simple rule of thumb to determine adequate protein levels for athletes. They recommend 0.8 grams of protein daily for each kilogram of body weight, or, stated another way, 3.6 grams of protein are needed for each pound a person weighs. An individual can determine his need by multiplying his weight in pounds by 3.6. The table indicated is taken from Dr. Darden's book, The Nautilus Nutrition Book, and shows protein calculations for some weights. The protein requirements are essentially the same for men and women. Women, it should be remembered, will require more protein if they are pregnant or lactating. Being an old-school bodybuilder, where it was believed that bodybuilders needed way more protein than the average person, Dr. Darden conducted tests on himself. His professor was Dr. Harold E. Schendel, then the professor of nutrition at Florida State University and a man who had spent four years in Africa studying the problems of protein malnutrition. Schendel also published over 70 papers on various topics concerning nutrition. When speaking with Darden, Dr. Schendel learned that his student was consuming over 300 grams of protein per day in a quest to build bigger muscles. Schendel told him he was taking in way too much protein, even for bodybuilding purposes. Dr. Darden didn't believe him. Schendel suggested that Darden conduct an experiment on himself. He got Darden to agree that if his body wasn't using the amount of protein he was taking in, as established by how much of it ended up being broken down and its end products discarded in Darden's urine, this would establish that his body didn't require so much protein. So, the pair kept accurate records of Darden's calorie intake, including supplements, and calorie expenditure for a two-month period. During this time, they varied his protein intake from less than 100 grams a day to more than 380 grams, the majority of it from a protein supplement sold by a bodybuilding company. Here is what Dr. Darden recalled of his experience. Quote, all my urine was collected and analyzed to see whether the protein I ate was being used by my body or merely broken down and excreted through my kidneys. The result of this study startled me. According to the Recommended Dietary Allowances, or RDAs, my protein need for a body weight of 215 pounds was 77 grams per day. To my surprise, whenever I consumed more than this amount, the excess was excreted. My weight remained relatively constant, and I noted no difference in strength, regardless of the amount of protein consumed. In fact, when I went off my massive protein diet, relieving my body of the burden of metabolizing the excess protein, I experienced a surge of energy. Furthermore, when I consumed more than the recommended dietary allowances of various vitamins and minerals, excess amounts of these substances were also excreted rather than used by my body. It took a personal experience to undo the brainwashing I had undergone during my early years as an athlete. Close quote. It should be pointed out that Darden at the time was an advanced bodybuilder. He had won the 1969 Mr. Texas competition at a height of 5'11 and weighing a rock solid 200 pounds. His physique was considered impressive enough that Muscular Development magazine featured him on its cover. During the recounting of his experiment, Ellington Darden mentioned RDAs. What are these? Supplement companies, for the most part, hate them. But before passing judgment, it helps to know what exactly they are. The RDA in the RDAs means Recommended Dietary Allowance, 
and these are calculated by a board that was assembled under the auspices of the National Research Council and is composed of large numbers of America's more respected nutritional scientists. Moreover, its membership changes periodically, both to share the burden of the work and to broaden the variety of legitimately informed opinions. The board's committee on dietary allowances is composed of subcommittees for each nutrient, or in some cases for groups of nutrients. And it is the job of the scientists on these subcommittees to constantly reassess what is known of the nutrients and keep up to date on the latest research reports. They also study the quantities of nutrients in the American food supply, their effects on the body, and any additional relevant information about the public's health and eating habits. Just about every five years, the Committee on Dietary Allowances publishes an updated report called Recommended Dietary Allowances, RDAs. This report sets out guideline recommendations for different population groups according to height, sex, age, and weight. Thus, a Recommended Dietary Allowance, RDA, for 17 different groups of people is estimated for every nutrient about which there is sufficient data to make an informed judgment. The first RDAs were published in 1943 by a group known as the National Nutrition Program, a forerunner of the Food and Nutrition Board. Ideally, the RDAs were intended as a guide for planning and procuring food supplies for national defense. Now the RDAs are considered to be goals for the average daily amounts of nutrients that population group should consume over a period of time. A misperception has arisen over the years largely promulgated by supplement companies, that the RDAs are minimums for survival, whereas in fact they are set up to include generous safety margins. RDAs under different names are also set up in other countries such as Canada and the UK and by United Nations agencies, and these are usually lower than the American RDAs for several nutrients. In practical terms, these committees make recommendations which should provide an excess of any given nutrient for at least 95% of the people. Even this is very conservatively estimated, however. For example, back in their 1968 report, the committee's RDA for vitamin C for the average adult male was estimated to be 60 milligrams a day. In 1974, based on revised information, the committee lowered this recommendation to 45 milligrams a day. So, by and large, the RDAs are, if anything, overly generous rather than inadequate. The global dietary supplement market was valued at $151.9 billion in 2021 and reached $167.5 billion in 2023. It is projected to grow to $239.4 billion by 2028. And that buys a lot of lobby power and a lot of advertising. Not surprisingly, the marketing approach of those selling supplements is to claim that what the Senate Subcommittee on Nutrition recommends, the Recommended Dietary Allowances, or RDAs, just aren't set high enough for good health, and in the case of protein, to build muscle. Therefore, they argue, we need to supplement our diet. The truth is that the RDAs are estimated to exceed the requirements of most individuals, which would thereby ensure that the needs of nearly all are met. As an example of how RDAs are determined, the following is a simplification of the calculations utilized to determine the RDA for protein in adult males. First, it must be determined how much protein the average adult male loses each day so that the amount that has to be replaced by diet can be determined. These are based on a hypothetical individual known as the reference man. The reference man is considered to be 25 years old, to weigh 154 pounds, to be moderately active, and to live where the mean temperature is 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The reference female is considered to weigh 110 pounds. Numerous studies indicate that the following are the average losses of protein from the body of a healthy male. Metabolic urine, 16 grams. Fecal material, 5 grams. Loss of skin, hair, etc., 2 grams. Minor, saliva, etc., 1 gram. Total loss, 24 grams a day. So, the average man loses 24 grams of protein per day and hence should need to consume 24 grams a day to replace this loss. The RDA, however, attempts to meet the needs of almost all healthy people, 
so a recommendation that was valid only for the average person is not made. Rather, it is noted that when studying the protein needs of groups of males, that one standard deviation is about 15%. Two standard deviations would be 30% for protein. If the need for protein are normally distributed, the two standard deviations should ensure that 97.5% of the population is receiving an adequate diet. So, the requirement was increased by 30%. 24 plus 7.2 equals 31.2 grams per day. However, while 31.2 grams per day should meet the needs of 97.5% of the adult male population, not all proteins are equally utilized. And so this population might be consuming proteins that are not ideal. To be sure that this is not a problem, it is assumed that the proteins will only be 75% utilized. And to correct for this, the RDA was increased by 30%, which is equal to about 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So the requirement for the reference man is 70 times 0.8, which equals 56 grams of protein per day. Note that this is not a minimum requirement or an average one. Rather, it has many safeguards built in and is intended to cover practically all healthy people. And again, as nobody can know ahead of time precisely how much muscle they will gain each week, month, or year, simply mowing down huge amounts of protein is ridiculous, particularly since, as we've seen, the body does not use any additional protein beyond its need. The simple fact is that while protein and amino acids are a basic necessity of life and health, they are not miracle nutrients, as some promoters would have us believe. When we have adequate protein with adequate amounts of essential amino acids, additional amounts have no further biologic value. As long as the cells have all the amino acids they need, more will not be put to work. To pour excess amino acids into the body is, as nutritionist Ronald Deutsch claimed, quote, no different than delivering to a mason more bricks than the mason needs to build a house, close quote. When dietary protein provides more amino acids than are needed, the surplus, as Dr. Darden experienced, is not stored as lean tissue. Rather, the nitrogen portion of the amino acid is removed, and what remains is a fat or carbohydrate-like structure, depending on the structure of the particular amino acid, that is either converted to body fat or broken down to provide calories. As for the nitrogen portion, it is a liability for the body, since it can convert to ammonia, which is toxic even in fairly low concentrations. To prevent this toxicity, the discarded nitrogen is made into urea, which is disposed of in the urine. When protein is consumed beyond the body's need for it, a correspondingly large amount of urea is formed. The kidneys in turn must make more urine because more urea must be discarded. Thus, those taking in large excesses of amino acids need more water and are thirstier because they urinate more. This need to get rid of urea through urination is the main reason why high-protein weight loss diets can be effective in the short run. The body is forced to dump water in a hurry, often resulting in a sudden loss of weight. Of course, the loss is in water, not fat. When the water stores are replenished, the weight shoots back up. In line with Dr. Darden's conclusion regarding protein intake, McMaster University, one of Canada's leading exercise and nutrition science centers, released a study indicating that bodybuilders who consume up to three to four times the recommended daily intake of protein actually need only 10% extra protein per day. The researchers at McMaster University calculated daily protein requirements by monitoring intake and output of protein in the subject's sweat, urine, and feces and you thought a physiologist's work was all glamour and lecture circuits. The recommended daily average intake for adults was determined to be 0.7 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. For a 154-pound bodybuilder, then, this translates to about 49 grams of protein a day. The equivalent of 16 ounces of milk, 3 ounces of chicken, 5 slices of bread, or 4 cups of spaghetti. I can hear the cries of protest already. But this figure of 0.7 is based on what the average individual requires, and bodybuilders work much harder than the average individual. This is true, and there is some evidence in the science literature to support that. But how much more? 
Well, let's boost that percentage by 28.5% to 0.9 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Remember, the bodybuilders may be more active than the average man, but not that much more active. And protein requirements depend on body weight, not activity levels. So, unless your body weight is fluctuating wildly, your protein requirement is usually pretty stable. In this scenario, that same 154-pound bodybuilder now needs 63 grams of protein a day, only 14 more grams. And in case you think that such a low protein intake might cause you to lose muscle, it may interest you to learn that when Mike Menser was training for his first professional contest, the Southern Pro Cup in 1979, he was consuming only 60 grams of protein per day. Quote, My diet is now more in tune with the human body's biochemistry than with any program I've ever followed. By reducing total calories in any diet, a person will lose fat weight. The primary way I reduced calories for this competition was to cut back drastically on my consumption of fats, no beef then, and reduce my protein intake to 60 grams per day. Undoubtedly, this sounds incredible to you, but your body does not need more than that amount to build huge muscles, since it is perfectly capable of manufacturing its own protein from other foods." Close quote. This is certainly true, providing you are obtaining your other food protein from sources such as beef, fish, poultry, eggs, tofu, milk, lentils, or beans, which contain the nine essential amino acids. If this is how you are obtaining your protein, then your body can create 11 more amino acids. And from these 20, your body can make any proteins for which you have the genetic instructions. Remember that each time your body weight increases or decreases, you must recalculate your protein requirements. Failure to do so could upset your bodybuilding progress, as protein consumed in excess of the body's needs is, as we've seen, either excreted, which represents a waste of money, or worse, converted to glucose, which can be stored as fat. In Mike's book, Heavy Duty Nutrition, he makes the following suggestion. Quote, while some controversy exists regarding how much protein we need in our daily diets, most reputable sources recommend about one half gram per kilo, 2.2 pounds, of body weight. To be on the safe side, the RDA committee, providing for disease, stress, and other possible problems, recommends 0.80 grams per kilo of body weight. For a 220 pound bodybuilder, daily protein requirements would be 80 grams. Close quote. This puts his recommendation in line with Dr. Darden's. According to Mike, I know bodybuilders have been told for years that because they are indeed bodybuilders and very different from the average person, they need more protein. This is not necessarily true. Keep in mind again that muscle growth on a daily basis is very, very slow. 10 pounds gained in one year comes out to less than 12 grams gained per day. That's less than half an ounce of muscle gain per day and most of that is water. How much extra protein do you think you need to gain 12 grams of muscle a day, most of which is water anyway? Obviously very little. It should also be noted that an adequate intake of all nutrients, not just protein, must be provided in order for you to maintain your existing level of muscle mass. Interesting to note here is most bodybuilders are, are in fact grossly overnourished, especially here in America where the average American is overnourished. The average bodybuilder is literally grossly overnourished. And the average bodybuilder does not make much progress, if any. If an individual is overnourished or even adequately well nourished and he's not making bodybuilding progress, then do you see that his problem ain't nutrition? If you're overnourished, by definition, you've covered all your nutritional bases. How can you have a problem? If you're overnourished, or well-nourished and you ain't growing, then your problem is related to training. In fact, and this is the key point, training is the first requirement. Nutrition is only a secondary consideration. It is only within the context of first having stimulated growth through proper high-intensity training that nutrition, nutrition then becomes a factor and then it's quite simple once again. All you've got to do is get a well-balanced diet which can be obtained by consuming a certain number of portions each day from the four basic food groups. 
Number one, cereals and grains. Number two, fruits and vegetables. Number three, meat, fish, and poultry. Number four, milk and dairy products. Just like we learned in high school health class, just as you would learn in college if you were to study nutritional science, just as they teach in medical schools. A well-balanced diet, by definition, provides the body with all the nutrients it needs. 